say, ain't no reason to fear when God's in it. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated all over the house this morning. Welcome to Northwoods Church. Northwoods, can we give every visitor today with us a big hand for being with us this morning? This beautiful Monday morning. Now can we give our whole life family a big hand that's dedicated to everyone for our online services? I do appreciate each and every one of you. We wish you guys a very, very happy Mother's Day. Um, I want to remind everyone tonight at 6 30, we will be having, uh, starting our revival with Brother Johan Brewer, and I'm excited about that. Amen. Amen. I don't know how many have been praying this week. Oh, we've asked you to pray and fast this week, and uh, I know that there have been some prayers going up. There has been some warring in the spirit, and I'm excited. I believe this week is going to be revealing. I believe it's going to When this thing's over with, amen, and we're going to have more meat than we can eat, and I'm excited about that, which means we got to share the meat, amen. we got to share the word of God. What God gives to us, Freely you have been given, so we are to freely give. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, on this Mother's Day, uh, many of you guys are a part of Friday night on uh, Mommy and Me painting, and I, I have heard nothing but good things from that and how much of a blessing it was for many of the ladies to just get out and do something special with everything we've had this last year and not being able to get out and do the things that, and having that fellowship. Being able to do that Friday night, I believe, was a medicine to many, many souls, especially being able to do it with their children. So let's give our ladies a big hand for putting that together. We thank you for all of you that laid this down and made that possible so that we can give our community something to enjoy the mothers that be here with their child or children. Uh, if you're like with you so uh, we are excited about that but uh, we we didn't want it to stop there we wanted to do something special for you here on Sunday morning um, so could I go ahead and get a couple of ushers can I, I didn't prepare this but can I get a couple of ushers to come stand before me right here and while they're doing that every mother whether you're whether you have a uh, a child here with you today or or maybe you know you've had a rough time in your life and maybe you've never looked at yourself as a mother but you lost a child or you're hurting or, or, or things are, are, are heartache. But let me tell you something. Ladies, you are mothers in this church. You, are, you, you have the opportunity. All these young people sitting around, you have the opportunity to help us mother them in the spirit. And I am thankful for each and every person. But if you are a mother here today, will you please stand all over the house? Don't be shy. This is, for, this is for visitors. This is for members. This is for, for anybody and everybody. If you are a mother here today, I want you to stand, and we are so thankful. Northwoods Church, can we put our hands together and give these mothers a gigantic hand? And I want you to keep standing, if you will, and I want to just say something on behalf of our mothers and our ladies. You know, the women... In a lot of religions and in a lot of history have always been looked down on as being the lesser person. I, I served a year in Afghanistan and to see men walking down the road dressed up nice and they get to walk on the smooth parts of the road and to see their wives covered, having to cover themselves in the middle of a 120 degree day and walk in the ditch 10 feet behind their husbands because in their mind that's what being submissive looks like but you know if it wasn't for a mother you wouldn't have a child God intended for the mother yes the Bible says submit yourself to the husbands but husbands I think it's our job and our duty to go look at the rest of the text and we are to love our wives as Christ has loved the church where he died for him he died for the church husbands we ought to be dying for our helpmate, not telling our helpmate to die for us. We reverse the scriptures and we take the scriptures out of context when we do that. But I want you to just take for a moment, and I, and I can speak on my wife's behalf. You know, a lot of times she feels like because she doesn't have a 40-hour a week job that she's getting a salary from, she feels like she doesn't work. And I know a lot of you other ladies can relate to that. Some of you even have jobs in you feel like you're failing at home because you're at work and you can't handle the things that are at home. But I can testify and tell you that I'd be lost if it wasn't for my wife and the mother of my children. I'd be lost if it wasn't for my mother. I'm so thankful that 
You know, when I go on through my life, I go to work and I come home and I handle the things that I need to handle. I don't believe my stress level gets as high as the mothers do sometimes. Because usually when the baby's crying, I can hand him to her and she, she welcome, welcomes him and takes him and makes him better and I hold him when he's not crying again. <laughs> or when the kids have sports and I got to be at work and I can't be there. She's loading up a baby or loading up the other kids or getting out of doctor's appointments. And when I'm saying her, I'm talking to all mothers. And you're, you're making sure your kids are there. You're making sure that they're not missing out on opportunities in life. And a lot of times us as fathers, we don't get to do that or we don't even understand that capacity of what it is to be a mother. And I can't stand here today and tell you that I know by experience what your jobs are like. But I want to make sure one thing clear to you. This man right here standing on this pulpit does not think that you don't have a job. Regardless if you get a paycheck or not, you have one of the greatest jobs ever given to humanity. You possess the seed of the man that forms the child who God knew before he was formed in your womb. And when he comes forth, he comes forth with an anointing, or she comes forth with an anointing to preach, to sing, to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ through many, many facets of life. If it wasn't for you and it wasn't for your sacrifice and if it wasn't for everything that you bend over backwards to make sure the family has, we'd all be lost. Amen. Can I get some men to tell me amen on that? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So this morning, it isn't a whole lot, but we want to give you just a token of our appreciation and a token of respect for all that you do. And I want to encourage you, regardless of what your life has held up to this point, maybe you feel like you failed as a mother. Maybe you feel like you haven't been the mother you could have been. Or maybe if you could just go back and clean the slate, you can you, you, you do it better this time. I don't know who this is for, but somebody needs to hear this morning. Your mistakes from yesterday don't prevent you from being the person God's called you to be today. You don't have to go back to change anything of your past, but you can look back at your past, declare that your life has been restored, your life has been renewed, and from this day forward, you are who God called you to be. You are the woman of God. You are the mother. You are the wife. You are the child, the daughter of the king. And you have a reason. You have a purpose to be joyful today because you have been redeemed. Just look at two or three people around you. Look at a couple of these ladies standing up and say, you've been redeemed. You've been restored. God's got a plan for you. And these kids sitting in this church, they need you. We, Us men in this church, we need you. Because without you, we wouldn't know what to do. So we are thankful for you. And because the Holy Spirit lives in you, the Holy Spirit works through you. To reach us in areas that we don't just automatically understand. A lot of times as men, we're a little hard nature. We're a little hard around the head. Mama always told me I was hard-headed. And I understand a little bit about that now. Because there's a lot of things the Lord has tried to speak to me, and I'd play it off to be something. That ain't the Lord. That ain't the Lord. And then all the time, then he'd have to grab my wife. And then he'd have to send my wife to me to slap me or to shake me or to speak some sense into me. And then it'd be clear as day. That is the Lord. So sometimes the Lord has to use that spirit inside of you to reach even us men. And we are grateful for each and every one of you. So I'm going to ask these ushers if they will. We've got some carnations here we want to give you. And this is a beautiful, many different colors sitting here before us. And what I want you to understand that we're trying to represent for you this morning is that there's some white, there's some red, there's some mixtures, there's white, pink. Every one of us have come from a different walk of life. We've had different troubles. We've faced different obstacles. Some of us have felt purified. Some of us still feel dirty and unclean. Some of us feel still, still feel unworthy. But I want you to look at these flowers sitting in this bucket together before we dispatch them out. And when you put all the colors together, it creates a beautiful portrait. It creates something that says, hey, if I put my walk of life 
and you bring your walk of life into the ministry and you bring your walk of life into the ministry and you bring your troubles into this ministry and you bring your experiences into this ministry, we are going to create a bouquet for this world that is going to make the beauty of God shine more than anything else because I'm telling you, God has made you a beautiful portrait. God has taken your messed up, jacked up, tore up life and He has made a beautiful portrait for you to be glorious, not only in His eyes but for a lost and dying world because He looked at you and said, I'm going to take this wretched sinner and my blood is going to purify them, it's going to clean them, it's going to restore them and when they bloom this year, this season, at this time, when they bloom, they are going to create a bouquet of blessing and glory for those that have yet to understand who they are. So we're going to dispatch these flowers out. And you're going to get a single flower. And every time you look at that single flower, even after it dies, I want the memory to remain that I am a piece of the portrait that God has. And I want that to remind you of how important it is to come together with believers, with friends, and with family to be that bouquet that God has placed for the world to see. So mothers, as, as you receive your flower, you may be seated, but please keep standing until we get you a flower. And listen, mothers, you might be mamas to your own children. You might be mamas to somebody else's children. But if you are a mother, I want you to get a flower this morning. Is that okay? Is everybody all right with that? Yeah. Amen. So I'm going to ask these ushers, if, we, if y'all want to get a couple people more, to, if we can get a couple more men to help. Um, we want to dispatch these uh, flowers throughout to all of our ladies. Can you guys just keep playing something small? We got some on the stage, too, if somebody wants to come up here. Don't forget Sister Victoria in the sound booth. Is all of our mothers, is all of our mothers taken care of? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Again, we wanted to just show, I know it's, it doesn't look like a whole lot, but we wanted to show a token of appreciation for our mothers because the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the apple of God's eye. Amen. And he is looking down on each and every one of us. And I believe this day, our mothers especially, because of all that you do, we are gratefully appreciative of everything. While we're here, we're going to go ahead and receive of tithes and offerings this morning. We can have our ushers come at this time to receive of tithes and offerings. Will you stand all over the house this morning and let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we're going to get back into worship this morning. I believe God has a word for somebody in this house this morning. And I want you to just go ahead. And if you know you have a need, I want you to go ahead and declare this morning, Lord, this word is going to be for me. Lord, I know that you've got something for me this morning. I know, Lord, that with everything in this entire universe that you could be focused on this morning, Lord, I know you've got something for me. And God, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to open up my heart to you right now. I'm going to open up my ears and be attentive to your voice this morning, God, because I believe, Father, 
That you don't just speak to hear yourself speak, but when you speak, your words carry power. Your words carry change. Your words carry authority. And when your word is spoken, the Spirit moves and things happen. As you get ready to give this morning, I want you to give intentionally. Don't just place an offering, but I want you to give intentionally. I want you to give an offering this morning because you believe in what you're praying. You believe and expect God to be able to handle or to do or to move in any situation of your life. And I believe as we sacrifice this morning, intentionally, purposefully, knowing that God is able, we're going to see the Scripture reveal who our God, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we may ask or think. God is a God of multiplication. The little prayers you pray turns into big blessings He gives. Father God, as we give to you this morning, we worship you, we honor you, and we thank you. Lord, we'd be lost without you. But Father, you are here this morning to, to minister to our hearts. You are here this morning to bless us in our brokenness. You are here this morning, God, to lift us up out of the miry clay and establish our feet upon the rock. God, I pray today, Lord, that every man, woman, boy, and girl, under the sound of my voice, God, those present, those watching online, God, those that will be watching later, I pray for a move of your spirit upon them, God. Lord, I pray that we not only look at financial means of sacrifice, God, but that we begin to sacrifice from our time and our talents, God. Lord, that we begin to give all of ourselves to you. And God, I know that in return, your grace is reciprocal, God. When we give to you, your blessings are giving down, are opened, are unlocked. Oh, God, and those things that are unperishable, those things that are eternal, those things are opened up in our lives, God. And I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that we see that revelation fulfilled, God, that we see the ministering of your Holy Spirit. God, that as we as we embark on this journey with you, Lord God, that we understand the power that resides on the inside of us, that there is no weapon formed against us that will prosper, and that every tongue that would arise in judgment is condemned. God, that, that we there is no, therefore now no condemnation of them who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, God, I thank you right now, Father, that you are fulfilling your word, you are fulfilling your promise, even in this very moment in the name of Jesus. We give you the praise, we give you the honor, and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. We praise you, Lord. Amen and amen. If you've got a gift this morning, you can bring it down. If you give online, we appreciate you. God bless you. Let's continue to worship.
right. Come be the fly inside of us this morning, Father. We ask of you to come right now, Lord. when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ yes. but for so long I ran from him I ran in fear of what I was going to have to do when I answered the call or there was days that I feared what I was going to have to give up if I answered the call which was evidence that I had other gods in my life but I am so thankful that God didn't get offended, that, do, that God did not get angry, that God did not get upset and just cast me off, but instead, He would not relent. He wouldn't quit coming after me. He wouldn't quit pursuing me. And the day that I gave my heart and soul to Jesus Christ, it is the greatest day of my life ever. Because that day, He put His seal upon my heart. That day he restored, he redeemed the years 
that the canker worm, the pommel worm, the locust had eaten. But I, I learned real quick that that day that I got saved was the beginning of restoration. He restored to me my rightful name as son. He restored to me my salvation where sin had corrupted it. He restored to me the abilities to call on the name of the Lord and He be able to look upon me and hear me. The Bible says His ears are attentive to the righteous. But you're, I realized along the way, even to this day, that restoration is a process. So with every thing and every obstacle in my life before salvation, God gave me a new vision for it. But I realized that it did not qu quench the obstacles from continuing to come and the trials and the persecutions. But it gave me a new, it gave me new vision, a new sight on how to look at the obstacles in my path. And I, there's been days it's gotten messy. There's been days it's gotten ugly. But I'm here to tell you today, just what God has done for me, He'll do for you. He's restoring and making all things new. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If we can get some light in the sanctuary, I like to look at people when I preach. And if you will remain standing before you're seated, I, I don't want to just make you bounce around. So while you're standing, I want to read my verse of Scripture for you this morning. Uh, I want to talk to you on the subject, the process of restoration. Now, I know this is a Mother's Day, and um, I, I hope and pray that um, you don't get offended because I don't, I'm not preaching on any woman in the Bible, but I'm preaching a message to the church that is for every woman in the church as well as every man in the church, as, every, as well as every boy and girl in the church. But I believe this is a word from the Lord that is meant to be spoken this morning. But in the book of Joel, one of the minor prophets, an acquaintance of Elisha during the same time of Elisha's reign, a prophet by the name of Joel wrote a book. A prophecy that would ring out in the ears of the new church in Acts chapter 2 when it was fulfilled. And Peter stood out and he said, we're not drunk as you suppose, but this is the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken of Joel. And we're going to cover that here in a few moments. So if you've got your Bibles, if you don't have your Bibles, you can look on the screen. But again, let me always encourage you, carry your sword. Whether it's on your iPhone, whether it's on your Android, whether it's, um, you know, your, your latest study Bible. But carry the Word of God with you. Technology will let you down. The Bible never will. Amen. But if you do not have your Bible this morning, you can look on the screens. We will have it there for you. But in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 21 through 30, our main text for today is going to come from verse 25. But we're going to read through this, and then I'm going to take you back a chapter in the book of Joel so that I can make the message un be understood, make it make sense for you. But in, the, in verse 21 of chapter 2 of Joel, it says, Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. That itself is miraculous to gain the former rain and the latter rain in the same time. And the floors shall be full of wheat and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the pommel worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward 
that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. We're going to stop there and we're going to pray. I'm going to ask you pray for me as I pray for you. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your many blessings. Lord, I'm asking for the anointing that makes preaching easy this morning, God. Lord, allow me to decrease that you might increase. Lord, make me the vessel that you need in this place today. Let me be your hands and your feet. Let me be your mouthpiece. Let my works, let my light so shine before men that they might see my good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. God, I pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice. God, that they would be receptive of what you are saying unto the church. God, that their ears be made ready to hear, that their minds be made ready to comprehend, and their hearts be made ready to receive and walk in what you have justified for us, God. Lord, I'm asking you right now, have your divine way. We hand this service over to you. This is your house. This is your congregation. These are your children, God. Do as you will in the name of Jesus. We give you the praise. We give you the honor. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. As you're being seated, look at two or three people say, it is the process of restoration. A few years ago, when I was an associate pastor, I got with a group of people that had taken some old trucks and old cars, and they had restored them. And um, I I know Moultrie's got a big car show here, and I'm not. I know that Thomasville usually has a lot of old cars downtown, but I know when I was there, I guess because I was involved, I heard more about it and I seen more about it. But car shows were almost every weekend. And you would go and you would see, you know, uh, a 60, I had a 67 Ford F100, had a 351 Windsor in it. When I got it, the seats were tore up, the dash was cracked up, the, the, the motor was covered in oil, the paint, the clear coat on the ugly, burg- ugly burgundy paint was peeling off. But I loved the look of that truck. And I bought it uh, and, and I went to my wife and I told her I wanted to put some money into it and she said, You do whatever you want to, baby. I love the idea. I support you 100%. And then I repented for saying that she said that because that was a lie. She didn't like the idea at all. But she let me do it, and I I, I put my truck in a paint shop, and they painted it for me. And it had a two-tone paint on it, and I had some wide radio tires with some bullet hole chrome rims on it. And had a spray-in bed liner. Had, I went in and put new steering wheel on it, new uh, gear shifter, took the gear shifter off the column, put it in the floor, um, just had this thing looking beautiful. Then I took the old, when I realized when I would crank the truck up and I would drive, every time that I would look down, my gas hand appeared to be moving faster than my speedometer. So I said, I got to change something. So I found me an old 302 out of a 69 Mustang that only had 97,000 original miles on it. I bought it, and I sold my 351 Windsor, put the 302 in my truck, got it all nice, got the big colorful plugs and wires, the big chrome heads on it, um, and, and valve covers, and just made it look pretty. Took it to two car shows, won two trophies, and I sold the truck. Amen. But I learned something along this process. I learned that when you take something that had an original purpose and over time, things change on it. You look at what a Dodge Charger looks like today and go back 40 years ago and a Dodge Charger looks nothing the same. And the purpose of getting in the old car shows was you had to present your vehicle not in the modern day t- sense, but you had to present a restored vehicle that looked, that acted like drove, that sounded like the old vehicle. And what I learned along the way, when I bought this truck, my, the only part of the vision I seen was me wearing a backwards hat and some cut off shorts or something and a, and a sleeveless shirt and a necklace on my neck with the windows down and the radio playing riding through a car show and everybody looking at my truck saying, that is beautiful. 
But the part of the vision I didn't see in the beginning was the process of the restoration. Restoration is we all want to be restored. Everybody prays for restoration. Lord, I want you to restore my family. Lord, I want you to restore my marriage. Lord, I want you to restore my church. Lord, I want you to restore my ministry. And we oftentimes are looking so far ahead, we're seeing the fruits before we see the plowing. We're seeing the work, we're seeing the benefits without seeing the work. But I can, if I can tell you something this morning, restoration is a very messy process. It gets nasty. It gets messy. There are some things that have to happen. There are some things that have to be removed. There are some things that have to be recoded. There are some things that have to be repainted. There are some things that have to be completely pulled out and things made new again. When I began restoring this truck, we began sanding on it. We began working. And the more I was sand, I would realize that somebody in the past had worked on this truck. Because when you, start, when you start sanding and you get through the clear coat and you get through the paint, then you're supposed to get to the metal. But when you start sanding and you get through the clear coat and you get through the paint and then you start hitting this colorful patch, guess what you just found? You just found Bondo where somebody had covered a dent or a puncture or a hole and tried to cover it up and smooth it to make it smooth again. So when we begin sanding, what I realize is never one time did I ever work on my truck, did I ever get it ready to be that guy that rode down the road with my backwards head and my cut-off blue jeans and my nice cases, K-Swiss tennis shoes and my chain on my neck. Never one time did I realize that every night preparing to be that guy was I going to go home wearing ugly, holy blue jeans, dirty and dusty and nasty, walking in smelling like sweat and stink to where my wife don't even want to hug me or kiss me because I'm in the process of restoring something that I only seen the end result. I looked at this truck and I wanted the end result immediately without going through the process of restoration. We hear people quote Joel chapter 2 verse 25 all the time, but they never go back and quote Joel chapter 1 or the early parts of Joel chapter 2. They begin saying, don't worry brother, don't worry sister, the Lord is going to restore to you the years of the canker, that the canker worm, the locust, the palmer worm, and the caterpillar have eaten. And we rejoice and we get excited because when our, in our minds, restoration, we go all the way to the end. I'm going to be walking the streets of gold. I'm going to be rejoicing by the walls of Jasper. I'm going to be dancing through the gates of pearl but along the way God says you haven't made it there yet I'm going to restore you piece by piece day by day plant by plant step by step and every step that you take some days you're going to go home messy there's going to be days you're going to go home and your back's going to hurt because of the weight you've been carrying the burdens you've been carrying and God said come to me all that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest the process of restoration is for not for you not to remain in the messy state of rest restoring but to take those things to the Lord so that he can restore what is good the process of restoration can be messy before I get into my sermon I want to hit a few things that are going to make you mad at me so when I preach the good part you'll get happy with me and then you'll forget you was mad at me all right so going into restoration What I begin to understand, I begin to ask God, Lord, what are some things that need to be restored? The process of restoration, the only way you can do a successful restoration is you have to get to the place where you have got the knowledge and the understanding of what the original architect had planned for the thing you are restoring. And in my prayer, I said, Lord, what does the church need to be restored? I know that you restored us when you, when, you, when you restored our salvation, when you died on Calvary's cross and rose on the third day. I know that you restored and you gave unto us power. But if all we ever do is walk out with the understanding that I've been saved, how can I go out and do the rest of the Bible if all I ever live by is I've been saved? I don't want to just say I've been saved, but I want to be saved. I've been saved. I've been freed. I've been delivered. I've been set free. And I'm here today to tell you, my friend friend how you can be saved how you can be free how you can be delivered because it's not about me alone but God died for every man woman boy and girl under the sun those past those present those still to come God's blood is sufficient to save us all 
So what does the church need to do to be restored? And God began to reveal to me, and as I begin to pray, and we're going to look in Scripture here in the morning, or in a moment this morning, and we're going to see one of the biggest things the church's original, original um, uh, setting was, is Jesus told them, go to Jerusalem and tarry till you be endued with power from on high. They had to go to Jerusalem. They had to tarry in Jerusalem. But they didn't just sit around and play cornhole. They didn't sit around and play pool. They didn't sit around and swim and sit out by the pool they went together and they began to pray they began to seek the purpose of God and they began to get in one mind and in one accord they had to come together they didn't get online and just say Peter I'm here with you today I'm watching with you today but I can't go outside because there's a boogeyman gonna get me no they had to come together they had to pray together they had to be present together and they had to they had to intercede for one another and they had to come together to do what God had told them to do and it says and when the day had fully come they were in one mind and in one accord that is the original plan for the church of God that is the not I'm not talking about South Georgia Church of God I'm not talking about the international church of God I'm talking about the real blood-bought child of God the church of God I'm talking about the one who every believer that comes to know Jesus Christ becomes a part of the church of Jesus Christ the church of God and and I began to say Lord what is it that that we're lacking and I began to realize over the years the things that are missing prayer has become a secondary thing that if I I get to it if I got time for it I'll join you for prayer but I got to make sure everything else is in place I got to make sure the banners are right I got to make sure the grass is cut I got to make sure the chairs are set up just right and if I get to prayer then we'll we'll make it happen we've got folks today in the church of God amen that are steadily trying to fight the legion devils they're trying to take on the prince demons of the community and they can't handle the sugar addiction they got at home They can't get that devil off their own back, but they're ready to come in and they're ready to fight legions. And you can't handle ignorant, silly demons in your own house. You've got to get to the place where you know how to take a stand and get back to the original plan that God gave the church. And that was walk out this soul salvation with fear and with trembling. Walk out who you are in God, declaring who you are in God. And when they seek to kill you, you'll know that you are serving my purpose. But we're living in a day. We're living in a day where people don't want pastors, they want entertainers. That's why I would rather get on the TV and watch the TV because there's somebody entertaining me there. But that person doesn't know who you are, that doesn't even know that you exist, doesn't even care whether you live or die because they don't know you exist. And they're they're, they're entertaining you on a television screen. When God has given you shepherds, God has given you a, a, a fellow brethren. But the problem is, is people don't understand discipleship. They don't understand how to fully be restored because they don't understand. Well, I'm the sheep of God's pasture. Well, I, by God, we've all been the sheep of God's pasture. But it is an abomination for a man to lay down with an animal. So you are not to remain a sheep. You are not to remain. You are to grow into the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ is who he can be intimate with because it would be an abomination if he laid down with sheep. So he has to come to the place where you become the bride of Christ. He's coming back for the bride of Christ, not for the pasture of sheep. He's coming back for the church without spot and without blemish. He's coming back for a people that have understood their plan, have understood their purpose, and are seeking to do the will of God. Again, I promise it's going to get better, y'all. We are living in a day and an hour where church, I re, uh, we talked about it this past week, and we, I remembered what I was gonna, trying to say last week on that post on Facebook. And it's probably going to slip my mind as I try to say it again. But when something is convenient for you, you'll do what's comfortable. You'll do, if it works out, you'll be there. If it doesn't work out, you won't. When it's convenient, I'm afraid the church has become a convenience because everything else is a priority. A priority is what you'll do at all cost. But a convenience is what you'll do when it's convenient, when it's comfortable. Prayer is the thing that the church 
needs more than it needs anything else because when you talk to God, when you get in the presence of God and you can talk to God, that's where you get his word. That's where you get his understanding. That's where you get his will for your life. No man can know the will of God. That's why we need prayer and we need the infilling of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit knows the will of God. And when you feel are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit uses you and reveals through you the will of God. And we have to get to the place where God is the priority, where God is the number one thing that matters. I want to go back with you to the uh, book of Joel. I want to go with you to the book of, uh, book of Joel, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And I want to show you here, Joel, chapter 2, verse 25. There's a process before the restoration. This is something, these, these locusts, now I want you, I want to tell you something. The, the, the word in the, in the Hebrew for the locust, the canker, the polywon, all of these are a locust at some point of their life. They start small, feeding on this thing, but then they grow and they, like a caterpillar, will become a butterfly. They grow into something greater and they can cause more damage. And the longer that it's left there to keep feeding, the bigger it will grow and the harder it will be to overcome. Have you ever asked yourself, and I was born and raised in a Pentecostal church, so I was born, you know, hearing and, and, and seeing, and, and, and I've, I've watched the ministries of like T.L. Lowry where, where in, the mo- in the moment of, of preaching a demon or would man- try to manifest itself, and with power and with authority, immediately that demon would be cast down, and it would, be, it would be cast out, and things like that. Have you ever wondered why we don't see that in churches anymore? Because we have so many people ready to form groups. Because they're ready to take on legion. But they can't get over unforgiveness. They can't get over who hurt their feelings, who didn't speak to them, who didn't smile at them, who didn't come to their birthday party. But we're, when it comes Sunday, we're ready to charge the altars and we're ready to just fight because we're ready to take down legion and his armies. The battalion-sized demonic forces. We're ready to take them on. But we can't, we can't even talk with one another. We can't even fellowship with one another. The smallest things keep us from the house of God. We'll bend over backwards to be in other places to make sure we don't miss certain meetings and to make sure we, we show up at certain jobs. But at the end of the day, when it comes to church, when it, when it works, we're ready to take on legions. But when it don't, you guys can handle it. Joel, in the book of Joel, what has happened is because of their wickedness, because of their inability to follow and be obedient to God. The devil didn't attack them. Bible, the Bible says, this great army which I sent among you. See, God loves you enough to mess you up. He loves you enough to take everything in your life that takes you away from him and remove it. And you would think, what kind of a loving God would do that? You tell me what kind of a loving God would let you prosper on this earth and burn in hell. A loving God that will take everything from me so that I don't miss the eternity with him. I would much rather consider him a loving God than a God that would give me all of my riches and give me all of my time and everything that I want to do and let me enjoy my life here on earth, which is nothing but a speck here today, gone tomorrow, and then live for eternity separated from my father. A loving God. Joel chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Tell ye your children of it. And then I want you to let your children tell their children. And then I want their children to tell another generation. In other words, I don't want this just to live out here. I want you to understand exactly what I'm about to do in, the, in Israel. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. Well, we got attacked by the palmer worm, but whew, at least we got a little bit left. Then the locust came and eat what the palmer worm didn't eat. And that which the locust have left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm have left hath the caterpillar eaten. This was happening at a very rapid pace. But can I tell you, we talked about it. Um, I can't remember where we was at, but someone brought up that song, Slow Fade, by I think it's Casting Crowns. What we have to realize, church, is that all of the enemy's attacks are not quick and rapid. It's subtle. It's a slow fade. 
In other words, if I can make you focus on this part of church and I can get you away from the spiritual part of church, I can take away your power. So slowly but surely, I'm going to make you a house for people, but I'm going to keep you from being a house of God. I'm going to make you a dwelling place for hope, but I'm going to kill your faith. I'm going to make you a place where you can see clearly with your eyes, but I will cloud your vision spiritually. That you don't know what's God and what isn't God. That you will hear every encouraging word and believe that it is of the Lord. He says what was left, the next one would eat. What, come, what was left of that one, then the next one would eat. And listen, this is physically happening, but it is not the ends me. It's not, it's not just about a worm or a locust. This is about a spiritual happening. And church, if we've ever lived in a day where Joel was talking about now, is this the day and hour in which we live where things are steadily being consumed? When we walk outside, the fruits are not there anymore. What used to be a fruitful vineyard is eat, has been eaten and dying. And the, the bark of the fig tree is falling off because the tree is dying. And the, the apples aren't producing their apples because they're dying. Ministers are not able to produce the fruits that they once produced because of the process trying to be skipped or trying to be overtaken. I want to move down to Joel chapter 1, verse 6 through 20. For a nation has come up upon my land. Now he refers to these locusts as a nation. He says, for a nation has come up, up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he, that he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Now he's beginning to give instruction for the process of restoration. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up and the oil languisheth. The new wine. What did Peter tell those people in Acts chapter 2 when they thought he was drunk? He said, this is, we are not drunk as you suppose. This is a new wine. This is a new wine. The new wine is dried up. Let me tell you something. This isn't telling us that the Holy Spirit himself has dried up and has lost his abilities and lost his power. But the Holy Spirit... He is not, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force you into serving the Lord. He's not going to shake you back to, to back to righteousness. He is going to obey the Lord. He is going to walk. In the moment you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. But unless you call upon the name of the Lord, how shall you be saved without the Lord Jesus Christ? Then he tells them, be you ashamed. We already know because we've read ahead in Joel chapter 2. After restoration... He said, you will never be ashamed. But he's telling them now, you need to be ashamed. O oh, ye husbandmen, how, O oh, ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. These men were responsible for keeping up the fields. These men were responsible for making sure the oil was flowing, to make sure the wine was new. And now they're, he, they're telling them to be ashamed when it was nothing they could do because this army had came in and had taken everything and killed everything. When there is no new fruit, there can be no new wine. See, I want you to catch that. There's a little bit of revelation there. When there is no new fruit, there can be no new wine. But, but Brother Josh, I can honestly say we've been praying for a fresh word. What's wrong with the old one? There's nothing wrong with the former word of God. That's the problem is we're wanting a fresh word. We're wanting a word. We're going to keep praying for a fresh word. We're going to keep praying for a fresh fire until we get the one that suits us because we don't like everything in the old word. But when we stick to the old word, we'll understand that priest, it is your job to keep the fire burning on the altar. It is our jobs to pray over our households. It is our job to seek God. It is it is all men's job. The Bible says, I wish that all men are always to pray, lifting up holy hands. But we want to seg segment who can pray and who can't. 
We have intercessory prayer in the morning, but if you'll notice, we don't have a designated intercessory prayer team. I believe in the power of intercession, but I don't believe in the office of an intercessor. And that's my personal opinion. You may disagree. Because the only reason I don't believe in the office of an intercessor, if you'll show me a scripture, I'll eat the page when you show it to me. I don't believe in the office of an intercessor. Number one, it's not in the Bible. Number two, the church is all, the church ought to be praying. But now as it comes to men in office, it is your job to pray for the people, intercede for one another. But it doesn't give you the office of the intercessor because all of us, when we get a hold to God, have the ability to pray one for another and I, he said men ought always to pray lifting up holy hands everybody should be praying everybody it shouldn't just be the pastor that has to come to your hospital bed and pray for you you ought to be fine sick enough to lay hands on yourself and pray a healing in the room you ought to be ready that when the devil comes in like a flood you remind him what the word of God says the spirit of the Lord has lifted up a standard against you declare who you are in the Lord believe who you are in the Lord walk out who you are in the Lord and know that Jesus Christ loves you enough to move on your behalf. Moving on, the vine is dried up and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because, listen to this, joy is withered away from the sons of men. I've read this, this text multiple, multiple times. And it was in this study where it, really, it, it jumped out to me and slapped me in my face, done two uppercuts and a roundhouse kick. And, and I felt it clear as day. All this is going wrong because, will you go back one scripture? Because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Joy has withered away from the sons of men. So before you lost what you lost to the locust, before you lost what you lost to the pommel worm, before you lost what you lost to the demon, before you lost what you lost to Leviathan, before you lost what you lost to Jezebel, you lost something far greater than that. You lost joy out of your own heart. You lost the joy of the Lord, and that is your strength. When you lose the strength of God, what can you fight with? What can you stand with? How can you gird yourself with the armor of God when you've lost the strength of God in your life? And I'm not talking, listen, joy is not the ability to smile and be happy all the time. I would love to tell you that the revelation of joy would be Joel Osteen on Sunday morning where you can just smile. You can just cheese, say cheese, and you can just make it appear as everything in your life is 100% all right. Just smile and just be proud and just be glorious that everything is wonderful and happy. But that's not joy. That's lying because everything's not always all right. You go through troubles. You go through trials. As a matter of fact, if you want to know if you're in the right church, if you want to know if you're walking with the right crowd, ask yourself, am I going back to the original context of the church where the church was persecuted for my name's sake, where the church was ridiculed for my name's sake, where the church was steadily under attack for my name's sake. As a matter of fact, the 11 of the 12 founders of the church were martyred on my behalf. Amen. If that's not the church you're walking with, then you're walking with an entertaining church that is only going to entertain you to your death. But you need a church that's going to give you the truth, the bread of life, the water of life, that when you call on the name of the Lord, you don't just hear about it. You know it happens happens in your life when God comes in and washes you from your head to your toe and you see the storms around you and something awakens in you and you step out of the boat onto different waters onto different levels onto different heights and different elevations because of the God that lives inside of you moving on gird yourselves you want to be restored gird yourselves and lament you priest how you ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth. You ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God. Sanctify you a fast. Call a solemn Facebook assembly. No, it's not there. Sanctify you a fast. Call a messenger assembly. No, it's not there. Call a solemn assembly. Call people together. Oh, I'll be there, Pastor. Let me just make sure I don't have nothing else to do. 
Oh, I want this revival, Pastor. Let me make sure. Lord, Pastor, you ain't had a revival in two years. We need a revival. Get a revival. We're going to pray this week for revival. I ain't going to make it this week, Pastor. Do you want a revival? Or do you need a revival? I need a revival. I need a, a, a ministering of the Spirit. I need the Word of God to flow into me and through me. I need God to shake me in my bones and say, Elisha, it's in your bones. You can resurrect the dead with the dead, but you got to get the anointing in your bones. We got too many problems. We settling for six men, and we quit looking for the seventh man. What's the seventh man? The Bible says Jesus met a woman at the well. She had been married five times, and the man she was with was not her husband. She had been with six men. Six is the number of the flesh. Seven is God's number. So Jesus was the seventh man, and when he showed up in this woman's life, it changed her, and it turned a whore into an evangelist, and she become a preacher and a teacher of the gospel, and if you don't think God can touch you in your circumstance I dare you to try him this morning I dare you to ask him into your life I dare you to let God move in your life God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think hallelujah sanctify you a fast call a solemn assembly gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God oh we're going to have a meeting today but I only want my leaders I don't want anybody else coming because only my leaders can, can they really do what God wants to do uh, he said call a solemn assembly with your elders and all the inhabitants of the land everybody needs to be there bring your dogs your chickens your frogs your goldfish let everything fast and pray and seek the Lord when Jehoshaphat called a fast they made the animals fast let everything get involved with this thing because the more you get onto it if one can put a thousand to flight two can put ten thousand to flight amen what would happen if South Georgia got together and started putting demons in the air started kicking them back where they come from all right I'm about done with my introduction Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land and into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Don't just go gather where it feels good. Don't go gather where the sunlight can gleamer on your face. But you need to gather in the house of God. You need to gather on an altar somewhere. You need to gather together with brothers and sisters that can pray. You don't just need to gather in any mountain range. You need to step where the burning bush is. And you need to step onto the holy ground of God. And when you get on the holy ground of God, you get ready because God's got something for you. I'm Northwoods. I'm going to go ahead and declare it. We're stepping on holy ground tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a, as a destruction from the might, Almighty shall it come. It's not the meat cut off before our eyes. Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. Joy is the ability to go through your hardest trial in your hardest persecution, and know all is well. That's joy. Joy ain't telling everybody, oh, I'm good, brother. I'm good. I Everything's good for me. I, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to pay my light bill, but, man, everything is good. Ooh, ooh, man, everything's good. Oh, how you doing? Oh, I'm just doing great today. I am, I am ecstatic for God. That's not joy. That's you being excited. Joy is when you go through the hardest place of your life and everybody's looking at the widow woman saying, what's wrong with your son? Or not the widow woman. She was married. But look at the daddy saying, what's wrong with my baby boy? Don't worry about it, honey. All is well. We're going to see the prophet. What's wrong with the boy? Oh, all is well. We're going to see the prophet while she's carrying her dead son who doesn't have life in his body. She's carrying a bag of bones and everybody that asked her, what's going on? Her joy said, all as well because I'm going to the prophet of God and if I can get to the voice of God I can get to the promise of his healing I can get to the promise of his fulfillment if I could just touch the hem of his garment I will be made whole hallelujah hallelujah moving on again the seed is rotten under their cloths I'm getting ready to close in about an hour two three tops the seed is rotten under their cloths the garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. The word corn is got two words in the Hebrew, and the word corn here is doggone. You know, sometimes we do something and we're like, doggone. You just, you just declared corn over your life. 
That fish, you out there fishing, that joker bites, and you set the hook and eat it, you missed it. Doggone. Well, you just declared corn over the water. Amen. But doggone, it literally means wheat, grain, or corn. The corn is withered. Wheat in the New Testament, when Jesus says that there was a sower that went out and sowed wheat, and in the middle of the night, some little punks went out there and they sowed tares among the wheat. And it says, should we go out there and remove the tares? He said, no, because if you go out there and remove the tares now, you're going to uproot the wheat. We need the wheat to grow, which tells me that even in my walk with God, I've got to grow up through some thorny thistles. There's going to be some thorns in my life, but every rose has its thorn. Amen. A great prophet once sang that. Amen. Every rose has its thorn. You've got to grow up through the thorns, but there's coming a day when God, when Jesus Christ is going to step out on the cloud of glory and the last trumpet's going to sound and the Bible says he's coming back for a church without spot and without blemish and he's going to receive the wheat and he's going to separate the tares to be burned so the things and the problems and the destruction of your life when you have joy in the Lord you ought to know you might be trying to choke me out today I might be in the fight of my life you done called the cops on me you done called defects on me you done called you done called the, the judge on me you done called my probation officer on me you done tried to lock me up time and time and time again but I come to tell you there's coming a day when God's going to pull you out of my life once and for all and I'm going to stand there glorious with the Lord because of him and he who called me son. I'm getting a little excited, y'all. I ain't preached like this in a while. Hey Amen. The, the man of God's coming tonight, and I just wanted to make a, just warm it up for him. Praise the Lord. The seed is rotten under their claws. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. The wheat is withered. The people that God is sowing is withered. How do the beasts groan? The great Hebraic writer Josephus wrote, We all are beasts coming to the trough. But when we leave the trough, we leave as men. The corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. I need somebody to catch this this morning. You've been praying for people that God wants to save. God wants to answer your prayer. But while you've been praying for their salvation, you're letting the altars get ashy. You're letting the prayer meetings die off. You're wanting a revival, but you're not praying for revival. You're wanting revival to do what you're not willing to do yourself. You're wanting God to come in and save the church and resurrect the church and create a fire. And you're asking God to come dig a hole while you're leaning on the shovel. God's giving you the tools. Until you come to the manger, the trough, where the bread of life is, Bethlehem, house of bread, Jesus born in a manger, bread of life. The beasts come to the trough as beasts, but they leave as men, but the cattle... They groan and they're perplexed because they have no pasture. Because the wheat that God sowed people, the bread that God sent to, for you to feed other people, it's not being dispersed, it's not being dispatched, it's not being prayed out, it's not being pulled out. We're letting our feelings get in the way. We're letting our emotions, oh, I didn't speak in tongues in church today. We didn't have a move of God. I'm here to tell you, I done got tired of the services where everybody speaks in tongues and everybody leaves the same way they came. I'd rather have a service where folks come down and they lay their addictions on the altar and they get up men of God. They come to the altar as beasts, but they walk out men of God ready to go out as wheat of the field. The wheat will bear its roots in the ground and will begin to burn, will begin to birth. It will move all of the earth to sprout its sprout. And it will begin to grow up. And then one wheat seed pops up. Another wheat seed pops up. We live in South Georgia, so I know you know what I'm talking about. 
everybody, if you ain't a farmer, your granny is, your daddy is, your uncle, somebody's a farmer in your family in South Georgia. Matter of fact, if you own more than a half acre, somebody's renting your field to farm it, amen. Everything's a farmer's field around here. And, and when you drive by those fields, you'll look out there and you'll see wheat, weed and grass and all this other stuff poking up. And then on your next day, you're riding by, it's all turned up clay and soil. You're like, man, they've done that quick. Then you ride by the next day and it's wet sand and dirt and clay. Two more days you ride by, it's wet sand, dirt and clay. Well, that farmer wasted his time. No, the farmer didn't waste his time. The farmer understood the process that I've got to uproot some things, that I've got to turn the soil up. I've got to get some things turned upside down. And then I'm going to plant some seed in the ground. And the rain's going to come. The water's going to fall. And while you driving by day in and day out judging me, thinking I ain't making no difference and I ain't nobody and I ain't done no good because I ain't got no fruits. You ride by long enough, baby, you're going to see this whole wheel field full of wheat because I ain't going to stop planting until the blooms begin to bloom. And I believe, amen, that there is an enemy, there is an army, there is a nation that is wanting to come against today's church. It is trying to dry up the wheat. It is trying to dry up the wine, the oil, the Holy Spirit of God in the church. Brother Josh, we really wish you wouldn't speak in tongues in that microphone. It's really going to confuse some people. We really wish you wouldn't holler and yell. Well, I'm just sorry. I get excited, all right? I ain't mad at you. I'm just madly anointed. And I just come to tell you this morning that there is a power that is greater than he that is in this world. And I want to tell you something else. That power lives down on the inside of you. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God that lives down on the inside of you is going to say, talk to the hand because my child ain't listening. Amen. This is a child of God. How do the beasts groan? The herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of the sheep are made desolate. O oh Lord, to thee will I cry. You got to quit crying to your best friends. You got to quit crying to the pastors. You got to quit crying to your mamas and your daddies. You got to quit crying at the dinner table. Oh, I'm going to touch on something, going to be touchy. You got to quit crying in your gossip sessions. You got to quit crying talking about the people you've been talking about. And you got to start crying to the Lord. Oh, Lord, to thee will I cry. Because it is only you that can make the way possible. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. Last verse. The beast of the field cry also unto thee. For the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire have devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Go with me to the book of Joel, chapter 2, 15 through 20. You can stand all over the house this morning. I told you in the beginning, restoration is messy. It's dirty. But I can tell you it's worth it. The smile that was on my face that day when I stood beside that beautiful truck, people walking by looking at my project and admiring it and at the end of the day when I heard them call my name for having a top 10 truck out of over 200 vehicles and I stood there and I took that picture with that trophy on the front of that truck it was worth every ounce of dirt and grit that I got in my hair and in my body and under my nails the process is worth it because restoration is your answer Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Oh, church, what do we need to be doing in this church? Oh, well, if we'll, if we'll just start some more programs, if we'll do this, if we'll do this, if we'll do this, no, this is what we need to do. We need to sanctify a fast, and we need to call a solemn assembly. We need to come together. We need to quit separating black from white, red from green. We need to quit separating old from young, youth from, from adults. We need to quit separating the sanctuary from the world. We need to be the sanctuary for the world. Gather the people. We've just stopped doing our live stream on Wednesday nights, and I know it's hard for people. But church, we're grabbing at every straw right now. 
Because nobody wants to come to church anymore. Nobody wants to sacrifice anymore. Jesus, I want you to die on that cross, uh, but don't ask me to do anything, please. I, I, I don't want to have to give up my, my weekend. I don't, I don't want to have to give up my, my, my hunting trip. I don't want to have to give up my camping trip. I don't want to have to give up my vacation. But, Lord, I want you to bring revival. Lord, I want you to revive me. Revive me. Revive me, Lord. Oh, I'll jump. I'll dance. Just as long as it's before 12 on Sunday, I'll do it. But if the preacher goes past 12, I want revival to end. Well, you're about 10 minutes past revival. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. You need a prayer closet. You need a place where you can get along with God. And so many people have used that idea to keep from coming to the place of worship. I was talking to our guest speaker. We thought we had it bad. We got closed down for two months. They couldn't put their nose out of their backyard for six months. They sure couldn't go to a church. But we got it so bad in America. No, I, what we, the only thing we got bad is spoiled. We have been spoiled. We feel like a bunch of entitled brats when we look at the rest of the world. But I'm here to tell you today, church, you can be an impact on the next man. God ain't calling you to save the whole world. That's his job. He just wants you to be an impact on the people you do meet, the people you do come in contact with. God ain't calling you to save Israel. God ain't calling you to save Afghanistan. God ain't calling you to save Jamaica. He's asking you, just save the people around you. You're trying to be a missionary, and your neighbors don't even know you're saved. Talk to your neighbors about God. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, get people together, and let the sanctification process begin so that restoration can happen. Assemble the elders, gather the children. Oh, no, get the children out of the sanctuary. They're going to distract me. I'd rather hear a baby crying in this sanctuary than hear one crying out there in a car wreck because they got a drunk mama or a drunk daddy that don't go to church. I'd rather hear a baby scream to the top of her lungs and I hope it rubs off on an adult and they scream a little bit because I like a little bit of noise in the church every now and then. I don't know about you, but if you can't handle a baby screaming in the church, you're going to have a hard time in heaven. Because we're going to dance and we're going to shout and we're going to give God glory day in and day out singing, holy, holy, holy. I can't get through this scripture, y'all. And those that suck the breast. He don't under, that baby back there, he don't understand what's going on. Just get him out of here. And listen, I'm so thankful for our kids ministry and our youth ministry and our nursery ministry. Because we ain't just babysitting your kids. We're teaching them the Bible. That's why we got children's church. That's why we got youth. That's why we got nursery. But I've been in some churches where you walk by the nursery, and you don't know if it's the nursery or UFC 69. Because they in there throwing and fighting and groundhouse kicking. One baby in a diaper got a child in a headlock, and you don't know what's going on. And the, the leader over there like, putting that putting that Twitter talk on there. But God said, when you really want to get restoration, you call a solemn assembly and you don't exclude nobody. You let everybody in the congregation sit in the middle and you sanctify them and you cover them and you pray over them and you let them pray over one another and then we all pray for the revival and we seek God's face and I promise you, God ain't up there dangling a dollar in front of your face saying, ooh, you almost had it. No, if you'll seek the face of God, he says you will find me when you have searched for me with all of your heart. God's just waiting there, ready to be found. He ain't playing hide and seek. But we're not willing to go through the process of finding him. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Stop hiding from the Lord. 
Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Ministers, preachers, teachers, leaders, uh, you've got a job to do. And it ain't sit at home until church time. But it's to get to the house of God and to pray and to, and, and, and to prepare the atmosphere so that when those come in that are lost and broken and undone, they can see that I got a family here, that I got a bloodline here, and the bloodline is Jesus Christ positive. Weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare the people. We've got to cry out on behalf of the people. We've got to intercede. So I don't want nobody leaving here today after what I said. Others saying he don't believe in, in an intercessory because you a liar. I believe in it 100%. But I believe that every man, woman, boy, and girl in here, the more you come to know about God, stop just praying about yourself and pray for other people that need what you got. Let, he said, let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Yea, the, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. It reminds me of another scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Anybody ever heard of it? If my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. First two things you got to do, humble yourself. That means stop worrying about you. Pray, pray about other people. Stop, humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive your sin. Then will I heal your land. Then will I do it. Then will I do it. Then will I do it. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, I will send you corn. I will send you the wheat. I will send you everything. I will send you the ministers. I will send you the blessings. I will send you the food for the trough. I will send you the wine. I will give you the Holy Spirit. I will pour out the blessing upon you. And then I will give you the oil. I will place an anointing upon this congregation that the hell cannot handle. Hell cannot stop. The anointing will break the yoke. I will give you the corn, the workers, the wine, the spirit, and the oil, the anointing. And you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink, somebody look at your neighbor and say, his stink shall come up. And his ill Savior shall come up because he hath done great things. I want to tell you this morning as we get ready to pray. You have the ability, you have the promise of restoration. But church, we need a praying church. We need a praying people. If we want a true restoration, we've got to get back to the original architecture's design. And that was, uh, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even upon the handmaidens and the servants will I pour out my spirit. We've got to get back to the original design where Peter stepped out in Acts chapter 2 and he said that, I, that this Jesus that you crucified will save you. He said what must we do to be saved? He said well call on repent. Call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. And that day 3,000 people were added unto the house of God. We got to get back to the original architecture design when Stephen would be drawn to a hole to be stoned that he would look up and say Father do not put this reproach upon them. He said I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. He said, we got to get back to the original architecture uh, design. When Paul, when Paul would be riding his horse on the road to Damascus and the light would knock him off of his horse and he would stand there blind for three days. But in the moment of blindness for three days, he saw more than he'd ever seen in his life. When he walked out of that blindness, he walked out an apostle of God and he praised and he worshiped and he led people to Christ. The thing that I'm trying to get you to see here is everybody I just mentioned in the architectural design of the church served other people and they prayed other people. Acts chapter 4. Where'd the music go? Y'all tired? Praise the Lord. I felt like I didn't shout them out. But the, in Acts chapter 4, we all know about the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2, right? You know us, South Georgia Church of God people, that's the only one we know half the time because you got, if you don't speak in tongues, you ain't got it. But I want to tell you that's a lie from the devil. 
I don't care who I upset with that. That is a lie from the devil. I believe in the speaking of other tongues. I believe in the, in the gift of interpretation. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you something. I read my Bible at, past Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 4, the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake with boldness. We need some folks that are bold enough to go into restaurants and the Walmarts and the Dollar Generals and the courthouses and, the, and, and to the White House and tell people, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ regardless of what it may cost me. Regardless of what you may take from me. You might take my tax exempt status. You might take my 501c3. You might take my building, but you can't take my Lord because he lives right here on the inside of me. And if you kill me to live as Christ and to die as gain, I'm going home to be with my Lord. So this is what we're going to do this morning. Why y'all playing? I'm just kidding. This is what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to ask everybody, every able person, I don't care if you've never, you don't, even, you, you don't even know how to pray. That's okay. I'm not going to ask you to pray in this microphone. But I'm asking every abled body to gather across the front of this church. I want to call a solemn assembly right here at the front. Come on, I know we got more than three people. Oh, my eyes are playing tricks on me. Every able body, I just want you to stand across the front of this church. We finna praise we finna worship, but I want to pray over you. I want to sanctify the congregation. I don't believe this revival is just an orchestrated design, so we'll have a few meetings. I believe this revival is orchestrated and designed so that we'll see a community revived and changed and hungry and passionate because the Bible says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I want to see a filling of the Holy Spirit. I want to see an outpouring of God. I want to see God's design placed right here at 640 Hall Road. I want this solemn assembly. I want us to sanctify the congregation. And I want us to pray for each other. I want us to pray for this church. But I want us to pray and I want us to seek the Lord's face about this revival. Can we do that? right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would move on each and every person under the sound of my voice. You know what their needs are. You know what they're facing. You know what their struggles are. But God, I believe you designed this day. You orchestrated this moment so that they would be present and that they would be a part of a life-changing moment. God, a moment where their lives would never be the same. God, that when they walk out of this place today, they're going to walk out anointed and filled from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, God. Lord, that there's going to be a ministering angel that's going to rest with them, that's going to that's going to reside with them, God. And that everywhere they go today, they're going to be picturing the restoration movement. They're going to be picturing, God, the revival process. They're going to be picturing, God, where they played the part in God's design for this revival. I pray right now, God, that you would move over your people. Lord, that you would sanctify them, that you would set them apart, that you would make them holy, that you would make them pure. And God, we're going to give you the praise, we're going to give you the honor, and we're going to give you the glory in Jesus' name. Right now, over this church, can we lift up a praise to Jesus Christ? And let's worship with our praise team for a moment. Destiny this morning. Hallelujah. 
Praise the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. I love the Lord this morning. He is so good. He is so wonderful. Listen, we got a service tonight. So I ain't going to hold you here too, no more longer. But I want to ask you to make every effort you can to be back here this morning. But bring somebody with you. Because remember, gather all the inhabitants of the land into the house of God. I want you to gather. I want you to go home and invite. Listen, you got somebody that tells you no, say love you anyway. Hope you can make it this week. Don't fight. Don't reject. Don't be, a, don't be the ugly person because they won't come to church. But you extend the invite and watch God do the rest. Amen? I want to tell you. He said, I will restore unto you the years, the canker worm, the pommel worm, the caterpillar, and the locusts have eaten. And this is what I want to leave you with. There's some people under the sound of my voice. You've been praying for restoration. God said, if you will let me work my process in your life, I will restore the things that look like can never be restored. I will bless you, and I will overwatch you. I will keep you, and I will hold you as my own. So when you leave here today, I want you to leave declaring, restoration is mine. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Last thing I'm going to ask of you, when you walk into these doors tonight at 6 o'clock, we'll be doing prayer in the sanctuary. I invite you all to be here at 6 o'clock tonight for prayer so that we can pray over this service tonight. We can pray over this revival. But as we pray, I want you to remember what we talked about this morning. The reason that they lost everything was not because of the locusts. It was because they had lost their joy. I will enter his gate with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. I challenge you to walk through these doors today. That whatever you got to shake off at that door, shake it off and walk through those doors. Hungry and passionate and watch God feed you manna from heaven. Amen. God bless you. Brother Johann Brewer has a table outside. He's got some great things out there. He'll have it all week. Go by, check him out. Come back and hear the man of God tonight. We love you. God bless you.